Bibles to John, the 12th chapter. And we are still in this series called Truly, Truly, I Say Unto You. We've been working through the book of John on these sayings. The thing that's important to these sayings, and as, as far as John, was that they were the key messianic doctrines. He goes through and lists 25 key messianic doctrines under a special identity phrase called truly, truly, I say unto you, which we've discussed in great detail. And we're deep into this now in the 12th chapter into this entire subject. And we come to another one today uh, in uh, our lesson passage is verses 20 through 26. And it's in 24, you see where it says, truly, truly, I say unto you. But what is unique about that is that he gives an illustration of the doctrinal principle. So let's look at verse 20 uh, now uh, through 26. Now there were certain Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast. This is Passover, the feast of Passover. The reason there are a lot of Greeks from other countries and a lot of Jews from other countries, uh, these are Greeks who have been converted to Judaism, and they've come to one of the three annual uh, Messianic holidays, uh, Passover. And Passover was a, a big one for many of them. Um, the, t the time of the year was great. Uh, it was April, always Passover was always on the 14th of Niacin. And um, there was just... You know, it's like all of us, when we try to pick our places we want to go. Uh, so this is one of the times when they, they took this week uh, and um, they f came as families and they did their tourism and they did their holiday and during the same time. And so there, there's going to be a lot of people here. This is really important to our story today, uh, to our lesson. Mm, the city... Jerusalem was a very large city to start with uh, as far as population of the ancient world. But when you brought people at Passover into this city, uh, your, the amount of people could, could uh, be four times greater. So we're talking about a lot of people. Uh, there's a lot of people moving in a very small space. Um, so, and, and that's going to be important to our story. So, the, the Greeks are in town, and this is a, a specific group that's mentioned, and I find that important. Now, when you study, listen to me now, when you study Acts, the second chapter, at Pentecost uh, of this deal, so you got many of the people that came in on the crowd. You still got them at Pentecost 50 days later. They still have the same idea. Some of the people that came in to, uh, from the different nations, the different nations are identified or represented. When you go through that list in the Acts, the second chapter of those who came, you know, they heard the Galileans speak in a tongue a language of their, and they list the nations. And there, there's a list of about 15. Different nations are there, and one of those groups were classified uh, Greeks. All right, so the Greeks are in town along with a multitude of people from other nations as well, some 15 different nations. And now there were Greeks among those who were going up to worship at the feast, the Passover, and therefore came to Philip. Now, here's the thing about Philip, and Philip's going to go to Andrew. The word Philip and Andrew are Greek words. They're Greek names. Therefore, what most theologians believe is that there were kin people or connections to the family of Philip and Andrew that had this background. I mean, it's the most unlikely person to go to unless you understand that, Philip. Uh, there came to Philip, uh, who was a Bethsaida of Galilee, and began to ask him, Sir, 
we wish to see Jesus. Now, what they're asking for is, is an audience. And so they've came to somebody they're connected with that they know is one, that travel. You know, people would do that with me, Billy Graham, like I could just pick up a phone and talk. <laughs> that was not true. I could pick up a phone and call somebody, but I would never get Mr. Graham. That we, we didn't have that. I could get Ken Bliss or Bob Pym. Uh, I might get somebody off from the team, but I, you're never going to get Mr. Graham. And so, but this is an insider, somebody that they believe can get an audience with Jesus. They want an audience with Jesus if they could. And then uh, came and they, uh, and so Andrew, uh, Philip finds, tells Andrew, and Andrew and Philip come together, and they talk to Jesus as a team to represent the Greeks who want an audience. Jesus answered then said to them, and, th th and this is where the meat of our passage comes from, the hour, listen to me now, the hour has come. Now, if you study the book of John, as we have, when you study the book of John, it begins in the second chapter, verse 4, my hour has not yet come. And you're going to follow that, and this is going to be stated several times until we get to this place, and it says the hour has come. And that's very important. And what is this hour? Well, we know what this hour is. That hour in the plan of God. Now, just stop and think about this for a moment. Well, I, look, I'm just reading the passage right now. The hour has come for the Son of Man, a messianic title of the crucifixion. The one who will cru be crucified will be the Son of Man. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Glorified means he's got to die on a cross. He's got to fulfill the plan of God. He's got to die on a cross, be buried, and raised from the dead, ascend back to the Father. That's glorified. Truly, truly, here's our verse, but watch. It's an illustration. Truly, truly, I say to you, unless a kernel of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it remains by itself alone, but if it dies, it bears much fruit. That's an illustration. Where's the doctrinal principle? It's in verse 23. It's in verse 23. The doctrinal, the messianic doctrine we're looking for is in verse 23, which is illustrated in verse 24, and practical application given in 20, 25 and 26. Application, he who loves his life loses it, and he who hates his life in this world shall keep it to eternal life. That's one application. Second application, if anyone serves me, let him follow me where I am. There's a promise, there shall my servant also be, if anyone serves me. A second promise, if anyone serves me, the Father will honor him. That's a powerful passage. The unique thing about it, while truly, truly is, where, is, is about the Messianic doctrine, it's an illustration, the Messianic doctrine is actually in verse 23. So let's look at verse 23 and we'll have a word of prayer. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. We're at Passover. We're, we're six days out from the crucifixion when he makes his statement. Here's another thing. This chapter 12 of John is the last public discourse of Jesus Christ in the book of John. The last one. What he's got to say here, he's done. That makes John 12 pretty important. Because if you know anything about the book of John, you know from 13 through 17, we're in an upper room discourse. Then he's arrested. Then he's put through trial. And then he's crucified. And the rest of it, as we say, is Christian history. Let's have prayer. I give you a moment of silence. I believe for priests to confess sin if necessary. This is true for those who are with us on the Internet. That's classroom etiquette. You cannot study the Bible as a spiritual book for spiritual people, for spiritual living. You cannot study the Bible nor apply it in carnality 
evidence of carnality is personal sin. It could be in the category of sins of the tongue or mental attitude sins or overt sins. They need to be confessed in silence, not for salvation. They need to be confessed for sanctification. It is the ministry of the Holy Spirit for those of us who are studying the Bible in this hour. And the next, it is for the Holy Spirit to be able to reveal the truth to our soul and our soul to the truth. And that's where the dynamics of transformation through your volition takes place in your life. And true change comes in your life. True change. I'm not the, I'm not the, listen, I'm not the, listen, keep your eyes closed. I'm not the person I was yesterday. I'm not the person I was a week ago. I'm not the person I was a year ago, five years ago, or ten years ago. You know why? Transformation is the power of change. And that, tra that starts in classroom where the hearing is transferred to believing and then the application of it, walk by faith, not by sight. So, Father, we thank you today for 1 John 1, 9 that says, if we confess our sins, you are faithful and just to forgive us and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. We thank you for that promise, for it is the power of Bible study. The power of Bible study. Our job is to keep concentrated. Our job is to come open to the ministry of the Holy Spirit and to listen to him speak truth into our soul. so that our soul becomes obedient to the word of God within our conscience and all the other apertures of our soul. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, chapter 12 is really important because John, John is now going to uh, run a calendar to the crucifixion. He tells us in verse 1, look at verse 1, we are six days before the Passover. Remember that Passover is a date, not a day. It's like Christmas. It always occurs on the 14th of Niacin, as I gave you Leviticus 23, 5. It's always on the 14th of Niacin. We're six days out from it when John 12 opens up with this account. Six days before Passover means six days before the crucifixion of Christ. That's what's important to verse 1. The second thing that's important before we get to our lesson text that's recorded in John 12 is that the Pharisees have plotted to murder Jesus during the Passover holiday. Listen, not only have, the, and they, they, this is set, they've, they've hired it out. He, he's, they're going to take him down at the most crowded time of the year. There's going to be a lot of people in there. They're going, to, they're going to put him down. They're going to take him down. They're going to murder him. Uh, but listen, look at the, at the, and so we know that from the 11th chapter 53, and the subject is picked up again among the Pharisees in verse 12. Look at Hebrew, look at um, John 12, 12. The next day, you see where he's counting? Now we're at what? We're at day five, right? We started with six. <laughs> okay. On the next day, the great multitude who had come to the feast of Passover, when they heard that Jesus was coming to Jerusalem, took the branches of the palm trees, and they went out to meet him, began to cry out, Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord, even the King of Israel. Jesus finding a young dog, he sat on it, and it fulfilled the scriptures of Zechariah 9.9, 9, Fear not, daughters of Zion, behold, your king is coming, seated on a donkey colt. Look at verse 16. These things his disciples did not understand at the first. But when Jesus was glorified, death on the cross, burial, resurrection, ascension to the Father, then they remembered that these things were written of him. In other words, that's the power of Pentecost. Pentecost comes after the glorification of Jesus Christ. There's your power of Pentecost in the lives of these people. When Jesus was glorified, they remembered that these things were written of him and, and that they had, had done these things to him. And so... And then he goes on uh, in uh, further discussion in 17. And so the multitudes who were with him 
when he called Lazarus out of the tomb and raised him from the dead, were bearing him witness. Right? And so what the, look, verse 17. When he called Lazarus out of the tomb, raised him from the dead, were bearing witness. And for this cause also the multitude went and met him because they heard that he had performed this, the raising of Lazarus. The Pharisees verse said to one another, you see, uh, you see that they are not doing any good. Look, the world has gone after him. They have now decided in the, they have now decided, look at verse 9. The great multitude, therefore, the Jews learned that he was there, and they came not for Jesus' sake only, but, they, but that they might also see Lazarus, whom he had raised from the dead. But the chief priests took counsel that they might put Lazarus to death also. They intend to assassinate two people at Passover. These are the, this is the scum of the earth. It's not Christianity that's the scum of the earth. These are scumbags, if you ever knew them. And so the chief, chief priest took counsel, verse 10, that they might put Lazarus to death also. And they're going to do it at Passover. A multitude of people. They're gonna, they think they can accuse anybody and come up with, we don't know who did it. As a... I bring that to his attention because we live in such a culture in America today. So they've applauded. They have plotted. They're, they're five days out. And they have committed themselves at Passover to take down these two people. They're committed to murder these two people. Lazarus, because there's so much interest in his resurrection from the dead from his, him being raised. They call it being raised from the dead. It wasn't really a resurrection because there's none until Jesus. But it was a, we call it a resuscitation. But he was brought back to life. And let me tell you, the most curious people in the whole world about that were the Greeks. <laughs> we'll learn about that today. And why were the Pharisees worried? Listen, it, here is their exaggeration but it will become true. They didn't realize how true it was. Look how the world has gone after Christ. Look how the world has gone after Jesus Christ. Well, that's true, isn't it? That is absolutely true. I mean, look how it got us, huh? We're the other side of the world. We're, we're the far, we, we are the people of the far end of the earth. How wonderful that is. Jews from all over the world had come into Passover, and they were wor worried that they would carry the message back with them uh, to the rest of the world, and they would have a real mess, which was true. And <laughs> That's exactly what happened in Acts, the second chapter. Now, let me talk t this morning about four aspects of, of the hour of Jesus' glorification. The first thing I want to do is I want to break this down to show you what I saw within this that was important to my lesson today. And so I broke this down into five homiletical points. And I want you to pay special attention when I get to verse 24, 25, and 26. Okay? First of all, what is interesting is the seeking audience with Jesus by the Jews and they're coming to Philip, and then Andrew, Philip gets Andrew, and they go to Jesus with a request. They take it to Jesus for a request. They want a private audience with you. They want a private audience with you. And I mentioned in my introduction that their names are Greek, and there could be a kin, there could be kin people in uh in town for the, for the big game. You know, you, you have people, right? Used to be, well, it used to be, when we, when we had the Iron Bowl, uh, you know, people would come in town, stay with you, and go to the Iron Bowl, right? That's the way it used to be. Um, 
So that's verses 20, we, and we read them, that's verses, what we see in that, verses 20 through 22, um, Philip and Andrew actually uh, bring that request to Jesus. In verse uh, 23, uh, we have actually have the messianic doctrine of the truly, truly. When he says truly, truly, I say to you, he gave, he gave an illustration of the doctrine. <laughs> Uh, Tony predicted that, didn't he? There goes, oh, go, there goes the phone. Um, the hour has come, in verse 23, here's the doctrinal tr statement of truly, truly. The hour has come, not is coming, the hour has come. Over on the second page, I took you in the book of John at point number four, which I probably won't get to today, but... I gave you an outline. In John 2, 4, 7, 30, and 8, 20, there is a statement made by Jesus, my hour has not yet come. In chapter 12, there's a switch. In chapter 12, verse 23 and 27, the hour has come. My hour, the hour of Christ has come. In John 13, 1, and again in John 13, 17, 1, What's important about John 13, 1 opens up. Listen to me now, this is important. It opens up the upper room discourse, and it closes us in chapter 17. And he says that not only has his hour come, but his hour has come for him to fulfill that hour, the hour for glorification, and that he's going to depart out of the world. to depart out of the world to heaven. And, of course, we know that in Acts 1, 9 through 11, right? Where he, he ascends. So, m many times we don't pay attention to some of these key little things that John is writing about, like my hour. But you can see there's an enormous study just in that idea, isn't there? There is. Yes, there is. Well... That's important, and the, 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 the doctrinal, the categorical doctrine that's in the Messianic doctrine of truth, truth, I say to you, is the hour, the hour has come for Jesus, the Messiah, to be glorified. So the key doctrine is the glorification of Jesus Christ. And why that's important to you and I, because it is ours. And not only should you understand his, but you ought to stand, understand ours. So this week I'm going to talk about his, and next week I'm going to talk about ours. Okay? Because this is the Messianic doctrine. Let me show you something really neat. See the word in uh, verse 23. See the word has come? Has come. Now, I want you to pay attention to this one. It's erkolomai. E R C H O. I may. I probably have it on your paper someplace, but but it's erkolmai, and it means to come. But here's what's important: it's in the perfect tense. It's a perfect middle indicative. You see, you wouldn't have expected that to be in the perfect tense when he says, but he says, in chapter two, from chapter two on, all the way to twelve, my hour is coming, my hour is coming. Then he says, my hour is come. You would have thought, when I first looked at that, I knew it was aorist. I can remember many years ago to translate this. My hour's come because it's coming, it's coming, it's coming. When it comes, that's a point in time, divorce from time. That's an aorist tense. That's not true here. And I was surprised when I, when I exegeted that, that I found that was in the perfect tense. You know what the perfect tense means? That it goes all the way back to the eternal life conference in eternity past. The hour that Jesus is talking about was in the plan of God in the eternal life conference in eternity past. Think about that. That's the perfect tense. And that perfect tense has been waiting for the perfect timing of God. And when it comes, it is still connected with what God said would happen is now in history and it's in the perfect tense. It's never going to vary once it becomes identified in human history. It'll never change. 
That which was promised in eternity past has been waiting, waiting on the perfect timing of God for this to come to pass. It's called the incarnation of Christ. Now the incarnation has come to that point when Jesus will go to the cross, die on, a, die on it, be buried, raised from the dead, and that word of God designed in eternity past identified as an hour. There is no hour in eternity past. There is no hour in eternity future. There is only an hour in historical timing in the plan of God. And when that hour comes, that hour will be forever identified as significantly important in human history. When Jesus Christ dies on that cross, is buried and raised from the dead and sent it back to the Father, that hour, designed in eternity past, will be in human history as the most apex thing of human history, and it will be that way forever. That's the power of the perfect tense in the Greek. That's pretty powerful. That is pretty powerful. And the indicative shows the importance in human history. I mean, when you look at human history and you look at the human history, how human history was changed through the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ, through the church of Jesus Christ, mission work, and how it changed nations. Listen, he said, go to nations and let's convert them to Christ. The church of Jesus Christ out of Acts 2 went to the nations to convert them to Christ, and the church has been doing it ever since all the way to our generation. Our generation needs to step the plate and keep it going. Every generation is required, and every generation up to now has been warriors. They have been warriors in the plan of God. It's up to us to keep that going. It's up to us to be evangelical. It's up to us to, 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 be, to be ambassadors for Christ wherever he sends us. It's a powerful idea. It's in the perfect tense and the indicative mood in the Greek language. Much powerful than you see in the English, I can tell you right now. So there is the doctrinal statement. Oh, you say, Ron... Listen, let me say, because I know I got people on the internet. Where do you get this idea of eternal life conference? Let me give it to you, and you write it down in your Bible if you don't know where it is. It's in Ephesians 1, 4 and 5, among many other places. I'm going to give you that one. And it's identified by before the foundation of the world. Before the book of Genesis opened up. Okay? Let's get that, let's get that understood. Well, then we get to an illustration. Truly, truly, I say unto you, and he gives an illustration. Look at verse 24. Truly, truly, I say unto you, unless a, a kernel of wheat falls into the earth and dies, it must die. It's enough, it's not enough to plant it, it must die. If it does not die, it will not reproduce. If it dies, it will reproduce. That's a law that comes out of the third day of creation, of Genesis 1, 9 through 11. It is a law. It is a law of creation, a botany, and it, or agriculture, and it is a law of spirituality. Man, it's not just enough to sow it. You understand his point? It's got to die. Listen to what he says. Unless, and that's a combination of a third class condition and a negative, therefore it's translated unless, and, and, and there is no exception to this. There is no exception to this. There is no exception to this. Uh, this is a law of agriculture or botany. Uh, unless a, a kernel or a grain of wheat falls into the earth 
and dies, it, you see, it must die because of unless. Okay. Unless it dies, you see, it remains by itself alone. It has not reached, it has not fulfilled what God planned for it. Come on now. I'm talking to you now, ain't I? Well, I better be. I mean, this is all the, this is all the seed. It's not enough just to plant it. It must die to reproduce. That, that's the power of the creative order. And he takes that into a spiritual a realm of thinking. That is, a, all of us that, if you plant a garden or anything, you know this. Okay? Because it is a law. It's a law of creation. It, it's a natural law uh, of creation. If it does not die, then it just lays there alone. It just, it just lies there alone. It lays there alone. But if, that's the third class condition, if it dies, it's all dependent. Uh, unless it dies, you understand? Unless it dies. But if it dies, it bears much fruit. I mean, you plant one grain, a stalk of grain comes up, and out of that one grain that went down, you got a stalk of a whole bunch of grains, haven't you? Now, I don't know how many is on a stalk of that. But I, knew about, I do know about corn because my grandfather, my grandfather, I got into this big deal one day with him, and he made me count all the kernels. And uh, I, I tried to count all of them. And then he said, he watched me do the first time. It was like we would never get done because I was doing one at a time. Then he said, I, I was probably in about the fourth or fifth grade. He said, how many rows? I went, rows? He said, yeah, there's kernels are in rows. I looked him up and I went, cha-ching. Uh, so I put my thumb on one and I counted them around. He said, now, what have we been sending you to school for? He said, count one row of kernels and multiply them and I'll accept it. Boy, did he cut my time down. And I realized that day my grandfather was a pretty smart guy. Now, I, I always believed he was a pretty smart guy, but that day the truth just struck my soul like dynamite. And I, I walked away and I thought, you know what? My grandfather is a really smart guy. And I'll tell you what clicked in my head. You need to really listen to him. And it was the, one of those wow moments in my soul that happened that was gigantic for my life from the fifth grade on. My relationship with my grandfather took on a whole nother level of me being a student and not just a person that sucked air around him. You know, took up space. <laughs> I realized how important my grandfather's wisdom was to my life. Ear of corn. Well, who would have guessed? An ear of corn could do that. The wisdom about it. And so you plant it, and, and of course it reproduces it and, and gives you much more from it. If, if, it, if it falls in the ground and dies, it must die. Otherwise, it just abides alone and it does not fulfill the creative purpose in the plan of God. Now he applies it to you and I. Look at verse 25 and 26. When he applies it to you and I, he plays he, this concept he wants to apply to our life. And so, verse 25, he talks about how it applies to the saved. He who loves his life loses it. And he who hates his life in this world shall keep it to eternal life. And so there's the first thing that he, this is a practical application of the doctrine, right? We are in practical application of the doctrine. Listen, what does that say to you? What does that say to you? What's got to die in you? What, what is got to die? In you? What is, the seed's been planted, 
The Word of God has been planted in your life. Salvation has been planted in your life. The Word of God, doctrines have been planted in your life. What's the problem? It just lays there idle. Why? Because you've not died. Look, look what he said. He said, he who, you know who the he who is? Huh? Well, put your name in there. We're talking about a person. We're not talking about a kernel of corn anymore. We're talking about a he who. We're talking about a he who can put he who can put his name in there. He who loves his life loses it, right? He's got to die to it, right? What's the principle? Die. He's got to lose it. And he who hates his life in this world shall keep it. There's his principle of what death is. It's giving up the love of your life for the love of Christ, right? And hating the old life for the new life in Christ. And listen, if that transition doesn't happen, listen, if that transition doesn't happen, transformation will not happen in your life. We call that old man, new man thinking as far as how this operates in you. Got to put off one and put on the other. He talks about love and hate in this group. And, what, and who is he talking to about this? He's talking about you. Not you looking over at somebody else and talking about hate, love. He's talking about you, how you view your life in Christ. <laughs> he who loves his life must what? Lose it. And he who, the next part, and he who loves, and he who hates, he who loves his life must lose it, and he who hates his life in this world shall keep it to eternal life. It's, a, it's your view about your life in Christ. I, listen, I don't know how many people I meet, they say, I, I say, they say, I am so distraught in my life. I say, okay. We go through, I immediately have to go through, are you saved? I have to go through a process. Do you believe that Jesus died for your sins, was buried, raised from the dead? And they go, yes, I believe that. Okay, then what's going on? That. We haven't died to self. When you don't die to self, you don't come alive to God. Unless it dies, it will not produce. And when you're in a life and you're stagnant, then you haven't died to parts of your life. You're still keeping them active. Your hate and love are all mixed up. You're loving or embracing the part that's making you miserable. You're, you're, you're loving that part. And yet, when you talk about it, you hate it. And so what we're talking about, how, how you transfer that. And the way you transfer that, listen to me, it's really simple. That word of God has got to come to life in you. It's got to come to life. And to do that, you've got to stop hating the things of God and loving the things of the world in your life. And the, it's the way you think is the way you know that. Are you, are you thinking divine viewpoint and applying and sticking your faith to that and going through the next step, step with it and see the power of God work in your life? Or are you holding on to the old view and you're not seeing that power change in your life? I'm just saying we ought to, you ought to consider it because this is what he's talking about. This is what he's talking about. This is what he's talking about. Well, then he, go, he goes up to a step further. He says, when you can conquer this part, when you can get by this, then you're going to get to this. He says, if, this third class condition, if anyone serves me. See, if you can't, if you're always being shift between what you love and hate about yourself in Christ, I call it being like a yo-yo. One day you're up, one day you're down. One minute you're up, one minute you're down. You're up and down, up and down, up and down. 
until you get some stability in your life about the way you view your life, about the your way you view yourself in Christ. See, this is what we're talking about is how you view yourself in Christ. And when you get negative on yourself, you've got to switch off from that and get on to positive about yourself in Christ. Therefore, listen to me now, you need to keep in your possession the pamphlet of the 20 things, you know, the 50 things. There's a section in there called the 20 status privileges. And every time you get down on yourself, well, you need to get up on who you are in Christ because who you are in the world is what's dragging you down. What you need to do is switch off from that into who you are in Christ because I'm going to tell you, when the devil tells you that you're a slug and you'll never make it and you're not any good, that's a lie because Christ has made it possible to you to live above that and beyond that and to have a productive life, not a negative but a positive, and what you have to switch off from, whatever the devil has told you to call yourself that's not true, that's a lie, the truth of you is over here in the 20 status privileges. Find that person and start focusing on that person in Christ. Because that person in Christ, he will fully equip. He's given you the power of the Holy Spirit. He's given you power of the Word of God. He's given you the power of faith over sight. Because what this is, is all about sight, not about faith. What everything over here is about is faith and not sight. That's important. And so he says, if, if you, once you find this balance in your life, then you will become a servant of me. If you become a servant of me, then follow me. Now watch what the promise is. Look, if you do this, listen to what he says to you. And this is dynamite. Listen to what he says. He says, where, there. Do you see that? Oh, put your eyes on it now. Put your eyes on it. See the where there? That's, see, that's your life. That's mine. Because wherever you are, there ought to be a there. There ought to be a there going on. When there's a where, there's a there. Therefore, where you go ought to be about Jesus Christ, and while you're there ought to be about Jesus Christ. And when it happens, production goes on. Divine production. Where and there are dynamite. Where and there talks about your preoccupation with Christ in your daily walk in the perfect timing of the plan of God. Where and there is all about your preoccupation with Christ in perfect timing. Perfect timing. Where there. Listen to what he said. He said, if you'll become my servant and follow me where I am, not where you are. Now, you see, you missed that. I told you to put your eyes on it, and you didn't put your mind. I mean, when I say put your mi um, eyes on it, I mean your mind. Not just your eyes. Well, I, I looked at it, I don't go back to sleep. No. Where I am, if you're my servant, where I am, see, that's preoccupation with Christ. Where I am, there my servant shall be also. See that? That's preoccupation with Christ. That's preoccupation with Christ. Wherever I am, there he is. Where he is is divine production. Stuff is going to happen, but Stuff is going to happen. Oh, listen. He stops at the well to get a drink of water. She comes to get a drink of water. He reminds her that this is Jacob's well. She reminds him, you betcha. And a whole... Co where I am, there you be also. Listen, preoccupation with Christ is where the dynamics of your life transpires with the world. I don't care if it's Chick-fil-A or Publix or wherever else I go. My main stops. Well, anyhow, listen. Now watch this. Listen, if anyone serves me, Right? And he's told you how that works. Where I am, there you are. Right? Where and there. Come on. Where and there. Say where and there. Uh -huh. He's got a promise stuck to this. If you will do this, 
where I am, where I am, right? Stay preoccupied with Christ wherever you are because where, wherever, where, there's a where, there's a there. Okay. Watch this now. Watch this. If anyone serves me, if everyone serves me, the Father, and that's how you serve him, right? How do you serve him? First, you've got to deal with this love-hate issue of you in Christ. The love-hate of you in Christ has got to be settled. You've got to become a servant of God. A servant of God is where there. And when that occurs in your life, in human history, on the job, in the where, beauty parlor, I don't care. There's always a where there. And when that when that moment of spiritual service transpires, God honors it. Just think about that. I mean, God goes, Hoo-haw! or something like that. That's a powerful idea. It's a powerful. The Father will honor him. Listen, the, the Father will honor him. I mean, there's going to come a day in your life. You don't think about it anymore. You, you don't deal with it. Listen, you've settled that love, hate, me in Christ. You now have become a servant of God. You're, you're a 110 percenter. You now live in the way of their power of the presence of Christ in your life. You now have become that servant Willing to serve the master all the time, every time, everywhere. And fa- the Father gives you that. And at the judgment seat of Christ, He's going to bring back all these things that you don't even remember. He's going to tell you story after story about the woman at the well and, and Lazarus and yada, 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 yada that you... You've got so many, you can't even remember them anymore. And he's going to run them. And, and there's going to be, if there's nobody else clapping, there's going to be one clapping. It'll be God. So will clap in it. Listen, one thing to be at the judgment seat of Christ is another thing to be an honored guest. The other day when I watched our president pin the medal of honor around that man from Alabama. Buddy, I want to... Uh, not, listen, what an honor. And then from the state of Alabama. Sweet home Alabama. I went, thank you, Jesus. We get such bad press out of here. Once in a while, it's good to get good press, and especially like that. Well, did you get all those promises and everything attached to it? When we come back after the second half, do you know how, you know how many principles I've given you? Huh? I've given you four dynamite ones. But who's counting, right? I've already given you four. I've given you four dynamite. Now, maybe you got more. If you got more, if you got less, you haven't been paying attention. If you got more, then I need to talk to you. You can teach me something. When we come back after this hour, uh, after our break, we're going to talk about three more. Three more in the second hour. Three more that are going to be dynamite to your life. Okay? Let's have a word of prayer. The meal will take the offering. If you're a guest, this meal has been paid for. But this opportunity for our people to give to support this ministry, not only here in Birmingham, Alabama, but around the world. And we're so thankful for this. And so, our Heavenly Father, we come to you today and we thank you. When I hear that you're honored by the way we behave, Father, I just, I'm overwhelmed by that idea of honor. Because I can tell you it's such an honor for me to stand here today 
it's such an honor for me to be part of this church. It's just an honor for me to be a part of the many ministries that flow from this church throughout the world. That's just overwhelming. We take this offering today, Father, and we offer it to you and to your great plan for the world. We pray, Father, that we would be always good stewards of it. To be careful how we spend your money for the kingdom's sake. In Jesus' name, amen. Back to John 12. We've looked at verses 20 through 26 and the background to it as Jesus gives us another truly, truly messianic doctrine. And this one, in verse 23, he tells us, the hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. We're, when he makes a statement, we are five days out based on John's recording to Passover or the crucifixion. In the first hour, we broke this passage 20 through 26 down into uh, five different homiletical concepts and we gave four doctrinal principles from it at least. And what I want to do now is deal with point two, three, and four uh, or as far as I can get. We were introduced to the Greeks who had sought an audience through Philip and Andrew uh, a private audience with Jesus Christ, they were very curious about the resurrection of Lazarus. The Greeks believed in a life after death. If you know anything about Greek mythology, uh, a, a, a great part of Greek mythology deals with the underworld that they called Hades that we do as well as a Greek word. Um, these Jews... Uh, had already shown us some positiveness in that they come from a culture of polytheism like Athens who has a city full of idols to different gods to monotheism. This is a big move on their part. We have Greeks who have been converted to Judaism and have come to Passover as a celebration. And so my point I want to make to you is that shows positive volition of God consciousness, they have moved in the right direction. They've moved to monotheism, and God has led them to uh, a religion that is about Christ. And it, at a time in their life when the news of Lazarus being raised from the dead by some of their people talking about it, and the fact that he was raised from the dead by a man called Jesus who was declaring himself to be the Messiah, the Christ, has brought them this year in large numbers. Larger numbers than usual because this word has gotten out. And people are coming uh, to this Passover for those two following reasons, especially those who are coming out of a Greek culture or Roman um, concept. So we see with this group of Greeks that they've already shown a positive listen at God consciousness. They've made, already made a great choice. The second choice they've made is seeking a private interview with Jesus Christ because they realize that he's the guy who raised Lazarus from the dead, and they're very curious about... See, the Greeks believed that you... They, you, there was life after death. They believed there was life after death. They didn't believe there was life of the resurrection after death. They believed that once you got to Hades, that's it. And then they had a system of, you could be in two parts. Interestingly enough, one of the parts where the, the good people went to what they would have called, said in the Greek language was paradise, and the other group of wicked people would have went to what the, the Greeks called tatarsis, 
T-A-R-T-A-R-U-S. Where we, we call that the place where the fallen angels went. So there, 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 there are a lot of, I mean, there are a lot of similarities for the Greeks, but they, the resurrection from the death, dead, was unheard of. Um, and so they were curious. And so we, I, wa I want to, but they have already made a good, a good step. They've made a second positive step towards wanting to talk to Jesus, which shows they're, they're still positive listening towards, towards gospel hearing. Agreed? I mean, that's, uh, how do we know when somebody, what, you know, if they don't run from the name of Jesus Christ, then we feel like, okay, let's talk. If they push back or run from us, then we, we don't have any options with it. And so they're very curious about life after death, especially when they have eyewitnesses reported the recent, what we call resurrection is not a true statement, but they would have called it resurrection. We call it resuscitation until Christ is raised. But they would have, uh, this recent raising of Lazarus from the dead, and he's back, he's back in a, a form. And the, the, listen, they're coming this time to see two things. They want to see Lazarus. I mean, they want, to, they want to see, touch, and feel, and whatever they can get by with, with Lazarus. And they want to interview with Jesus Christ on this. On this. And so that, to me, that's, but can I say to those who are with me by the internet across the world, can I say to you, even though these are very positive choices they've made in their life towards God, they are not saved. You can be this positive. You can be positive towards God, leave polytheistic kind of religion or gobbledygook, and come into a religion that has only a belief in one God, a monotheistic, maybe even in one that is like the Judaist uh, religion, Judaism. But listen, that doesn't mean you're saved. You're saved when you believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins in your place, was buried and raised from the dead third day. That's what you got to believe. And let me tell you, Christianity today needs to understand what a, uh, what a gospel is and give a clear gospel to people who, if they don't hear and believe it, will go to hell. And if you don't give it to them, then somebody else has to be sent in behind you because you haven't done the job. They're not there. They're there to get this information. That's why God has sent them. This is, this is a timing in their life for this. And listen, it's no accident when somebody shows up in your life and is interested in the gospel of Jesus, it's no, it's, listen, this is perfect timing. And you need to be straight with them. You need to be clear with them. And don't give them a whole bunch of gobbledygook. Give them the truth and let the truth set them free. It's not our job to convince them. It's our job to give them a good gospel hearing. And, and so th th this group is in. The Greeks believed in the underworld after death called Hades. Uh, they didn't believe in a resurrection. They didn't believe in a general resurrection or any part of the resurrection. Many of us read, like myself, when I went to college, and some in high school and especially in college, Homer's classic Odyssey. I mean, who didn't read that? And, and other courses like that. I mean, we took classic... I don't know if they do it anymore. The uh, Elysium, the Greeks word, that's what we, what we would have called paradise. And then they had Tataris. The good people went there. That was a good place, and Tataris was a bad place uh, or where the wicked would go. And Paul ran into this very problem in Athens when he got to the resurrection of Jesus Christ. They were comfortable until he said resurrection of the dead. When, they said, when he said resurrection of dead, they all sneered. And some of them went, I'm not listening to any more of that because I don't believe in no resurrection from the dead. And so many, you, you recall when we studied that. So how important, listen, I can't begin to tell you how important the resurrection is to the gospel. I say this all the time, listen, Listen, if all you got is a guy dead on a cross, you got three of them. Which one is the real Messiah? They all died the same day under the same law with the same promise, everything. How do you know which one is the Messiah? How do you know which one is the Savior of the world? 
mean, he makes it very clear. It's the one who was raised from the dead. The disciples, they were struggling with this issue until he was raised from the dead. Thomas even struggled with it afterwards by hearing reports. Unless I touch and feel and see and yeah, 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 yeah. Don't soft pedal the gospel of Jesus Christ. It's essential for salvation. I mean, Paul makes it very clear in Corinthians. And who was he writing to? The Corinthians. The Corinthians. The Greeks. In 1 Corinthians, the 15th chapter, 12 through 19, when you study it, Paul is going to say, some said... There is no resurrection from the dead. That's the way the Greeks believe. In the 15th chapter of 35 through 38, others said, well, what kind of a body would they have? If there was a resurrection, what kind of a body would they have? I mean, they understood the natural law that it buries it, the body. You bury the body, it goes back to the dust of the earth. The worms eat it. Yeah, 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 yeah. It, they, they, well, what kind of a body? If it's raised, what kind of a body is going to be? If it's been in a grave longer than four days, we know it stings. So what kind of a body is it going to be in? And so they had all these kind of questions, and Paul answers them all. And these were people, even though they believed in the gospel, were struggling with the resurrection. These are the people of Corinth. We just studied the people of Corinth on uh, Wednesday night uh, in our in our study on missionary evangelism. We're familiar with this. This is the part of the gospel that the Corinthians thought was foolish. In 1 Corinthians 1.18, the gospel, that gospel, Christ died for your sins, was buried and raised from the dead. Listen, he died for somebody's sin. He didn't die for his own. The other two guys died for their own. And one had enough sense to say, I think you've died for mine too, and got it. I'll see you today in paradise. And so, in, but in 1 Corinthians 1.18, you can see the Greeks, when they hear the resurrection, they go like, that's bunk. You had me up till then. And I think that's bunk. And so, they, they considered it foolishness. Paul told the Corinthians the same thing Jesus told the Greeks in John 10.24. When he told them, unless the seed dies, it will not bear fruit. In 1 Corinthians 15, 36, Paul said, you are foolish. This means, that he, when he says you're a fool, he doesn't mean fool. He means you're without understanding. He doesn't mean fool in a bad sense. He's using it in a way that you, you say you're intellectual and you're not. It's, in fact, your intellect is getting in your way. You're not as smart as you think. Listen to me. Is what he's saying. You fools, that which you sow does not come to life unless it dies. See, it's a law of botany. It's a law of farming where I came from. You see, Paul says the same thing, and what's he talking about? He's talking about the resurrection. It's got to be raised. Do, and the, what is the, what comes up is new life. The old dies and new life comes. That's the principle. And Paul told them the same thing to the Greeks in 1 Corinthians that he told the Greeks in the 12th chapter, verse 24. Identical. Both, both groups were Greeks. Isn't that Interesting. And here's what Paul means when he says, he calls them, he says, this is, you're fools. He means, here's what he means to the Greek. The Greeks, they had to, they had to think things out. They were logical. The Greeks were, were, were logical. The Greeks, they're great debaters. I mean, our whole debate system, the law system, everything comes out of the Greek culture of thinking, out of, Socrates and Aristotle and Plato and these guys. This, our, our, whole, our whole business runs on that. And what it is, it's a process of thinking. 
it's how you it's how you debate it out. It's how you process it out to find some kind of conclusion that makes sense to you. This is what he means. You haven't listen. You you haven't thought it out. So let me. And so we have the entire chapter of fifteen. Then he on the resurrection. All about he goes into a long dissertation about how the body will be. Thank goodness for the Greeks, or we wouldn't have understood some details. Then he comes back in the second second Corinthians in his second writing to Corinth and writes the fifth chapter about the same subject. They really struggled with this culturally. Now you may not struggle with it. I may not struggle with it. But people, there are other cultures out there that struggle with it. Some people struggle with, I don't understand how one man could die for the sins of the whole world. Some people uh, don't understand why the burial is such an important part of the gospel. Nobody, then, they, then there's another group that understand why the resurrection is important. All three parts of that are important to the salvation plan and program of God. The third thing, these Greeks have come to Jerusalem to worship God at Passover. It's interesting how universal the word worship is. At the time of Jesus Christ, this word is universal. When he goes to Athens, the word is worship. Everywhere he went in the world, both Jesus Christ and Paul, well, Jesus didn't go everywhere in the world, but Paul did. The word is worship. Everybody when he goes into Athens, they got 30,000 statues to different gods. They were collecting them. They become the university of, of intellectual knowledge on this. It was all about worship. The key word is worship. Everywhere. The Jews, the key words were worship. Listen, when he talks to the woman at the well, the Samaritan, it's all about worship. And it clicked when he, the more he discussed with her about it, it clicked. That worship for the Jew or the, or the Samaritan was based on the coming of Christ. And she goes like, ding, ding. It clicked in her soul. And she said, yeah, I've heard about this. And he said, well, I'm it. And she goes like, cha-ching. How about that? She got saved. She got saved through her religion. She didn't have to convert to Judaism to get saved. She had to believe that both of them represented the idea that Christ would come as the Savior of the world. She said, listen, it was them that declared in the fourth chapter, verse 42, it was this group of people that declared that he was the Savior of the world. The Jews never declared it. It was a Samaritan woman. Is all about worship. And these people have come to worship. They've come to worship. And they don't understand that. They don't understand. Listen. And why are they ignorant? There is no worship apart from Christ. There is none. Please get that straight. I don't care where you go and what you do. There is no worship of God apart from Christ. No man can come to the Father. There is no worship. He told that to the woman at the well. That was Paul's message to Athens. Nobody heard him. They shut down on the resurrection. If you're here today by internet or by automobile, and you think you're worship, and you can do this apart from the gospel of Jesus Christ, you've been lied to. That is not true. True worship, Jesus told the woman in John 4, true worship comes through Christ, then you worship God in truth and in spirit. Otherwise, it doesn't happen. You could worship, you could worship in spirit, but not in truth. The devil lied to you. Devil, devil lied to you, according to John, the eighth chapter, Eighth chapter. He lied to Adam and Eve in the garden. He, well, he lied to Eve about it. 
And what's a big deal about worship? Matthew, the fourth chapter, 9 and 10. Satan tempts Jesus for one reason. He wants him to bow and worship him. That's the deal. If you're not worshiping God through Jesus Christ, you're worshiping the devil through a false system. All this religion gobbledygook, it's a false system. And it's Satan's system to deceive you and to send you to hell with him. That's a pretty narrow view, in it? But let me tell you, the way, the truth, and the life is a narrow view when it comes to the worship that Satan promotes. These Greeks that have come to worship were like the ones Paul ministered to in Athens, 1717. They are Greeks with positive volition and God consciousness that must receive clarity of the gospel hearing. They will get that on this journey. Listen, you know what's interesting to me? They're going to get to see it. You know what they want? They want to see Lazarus. I want to see the guy raised from the dead, right? These people are going to stand. They're going to be amongst the crowd. And they're, listen, you think these people are not going to the crucifixion? You think this group of people, they've come this far for this time. They've spent great money. This is the big, this is the World Series business. They're going to stand there and they're going to watch him at the cross. Some of them are going to hang around to see if what he has said is going to be true. And three days later, they're going to hear the rumor that he has been raised from the dead. And many of these things, many of these people are not leaving until they have gone through Pentecost. And they're going to be present at Pentecost and go home with the concept that Christ has changed the whole concept of resurrection from the dead. I'll guarantee you, if there's one group of people that will go back and preach the resurrection, it's the people that stayed through Pentecost. That's what Pentecost was all about. The power of the resurrection. Do you know why the resurrection of Christ is important? Romans, the 8th chapter, verses 9, 10, and 11. The power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in you. Why wouldn't I preach the resurrection if that's the source of the power of the Christian life? It's an easy step once they understand that to teach them of the indwelling power of the Holy Spirit in their life. Without it, you've got to, you've got to play background stuff. You pop it in there and now you tell them what, that, what this has brought them in their life. Nobody else has got one like that. Next time you'll find anything like the resurrection of Jesus Christ will be the Antichrist in the tribulation as we've been studying on Tuesday night. What Jesus found in, in the first century in the last, his last Passover, what Jesus found was masses of Jewish people or worshipers of Judaism who came to worship with no meaning in it. It was empty. It was empty worship. Jesus saw them as sheep without shepherds because they were empty of information. A good shepherd feeds his people. A good shepherd feeds his people. And their worship is true and is spiritual. Jesus came to an Israel that the sheep were without shepherds. The people could not worship. They were empty. They had nothing to offer God. It broke his heart to come to an Israel without a voice of truth. In Matthew, the ninth chapter 36, you can see the broken heart of Jesus Christ as he comes to a nation that should be the sheep with the shepherds for the world. And there are sheep. He calls them lost sheep of Israel. 
In the 10th chapter of Matthew, verse 6, he said, I have come for the lost sheep of Israel. They are sheep without shepherds. There is no, they are lost to God. They can't find their way to God because they have shepherds that don't know. In the 15th chapter, he tells them the same thing. In, in Luke, the 15th chapter, when he talks about the parable, the first of the parables is the lost sheep. The lost sheep. Jesus said, I've come to seek and to save that which is lost. Jesus calls himself in John, the 10th chapter, which we studied last week, he calls himself the good shepherd. A good shepherd is one who lays his life down for the sheep. He says it in verse 11, he says it in verse 15, he says it in verse 17, and he says it in verse 18. And he said in verse 18, not only the good shepherd who lays his life down, but the good shepherd who lifts it up. Not just the one who dies, but the one who is raised from the dead is the good shepherd. Listen, if you come out of this church and represent the gospel of Jesus Christ, make sure it's clear. There's enough information in this great passage on the good shepherd. He makes sure that the good shepherd is one who not only lays his life down, is but one who's raised up. We read all of that in John, the 10th chapter. I love John 10, 16. It says, and not only did I come for this sheep, but I come for the other sheep of the foal. Right? You love that? And therefore, he dies for all of it. He dies for the Jew. He dies for the Gentile. He dies for all. He dies one death for all men. How good is that? John 10, 16. I love that passage. In Hebrews, the 13th chapter, verse 20, because of his death, burial, and resurrection, he is the great shepherd of the sheep. Because of his death, burial, and resurrection, he's the good shepherd. He's not the good shepherd because he did miracles. He's not the good shepherd because he was the best teacher. He's the good shepherd because he laid down his life and took it back up. <laughs> now, if that don't excite you, there's not much more that's going to happen this Sunday to you that will excite you. In 1 Peter 2, 24 and 25, Peter says, we are, we, are, we are all like sheep who have gone astray. And what is important is return. He says, return to the shepherd and guardian of your soul. <laughs> the good shepherd and the good guardian of my soul. If you're out there today on the internet or here and you've strayed away, the invitation is to return. Return to whom? Return to Jesus Christ. Return to Jesus Christ. If you strayed away from the truth of who his identity in your life is, who is Jesus Christ in your life? Is he a second thought, a, a passing fancy? What is he in your life? He ought to be the premier Lord of your life. The premier Lord of your life. He is the, he is the good shepherd, laid it down, lifted it up for me. Didn't do it for himself. He said, I do nothing for myself. I do it for God. It's not my will that's, that's essential to my life. You want to know what lordship is all about? It's about his will, not mine. Hey, you want to talk about lordship? There you got it. That's what the Lord was all about. And if you want to be part of that company, the, everything about the Lord is not my will, but thy will be done. That was the motto that drove his life all the way to the cross. Point four. Point four would be good for you to do your home, home study. When he says the hour, see perfect middle indicative? And what was the hour? Listen to me. For him to be glorified. What was this hour? What was his hour? Was it just coming into the world? No. Was that important? Yes. Identify himself as a Messiah through miracles and healings and all that? No, but that was good. No, it was to go to the cross, to die there for the sins of the world. 
which he wants to become personal to you and me. No, we're not saved collectively. We're saved individually. Each person believes in his heart the choices he wants to make. He is buried and raised from the dead. In the book of John, he makes it very clear. My hour has not come. Then he says in John 12, my hour has come. And it's the last public discourse he's going to make in the book of John. And then he tells you, as at the Last Supper, in the beginning and the end, it's time for me to depart from this world. And all of that, death, burial, resurrection, ascension, session, is all about the glorification of Christ. Well, let's have a word of prayer. Then we'll do our pledge. Then we'll be dismissed. Our Heavenly Father, we're so thankful today for the opportunity to stand and speak what we believe in our heart to be the truth. Based on John 12, the study of it, the teaching of it, now the application of it. There were so many different principles taught today, it'd be hard to pick which one was important. But the whole message about it was that Jesus Christ's hour had come for him to go to the cross. The Lamb of God that's come to take away the sin of the world. To be buried and then to be raised on the third day as he said. To give eternal life to everyone who believes. And eternal life is not just something I get when I die. It is something I get while I'm living. And it is something that becomes the abundant life in me while I am living on earth. John 10.10. 10. I pray that for each of us today. The struggles we have in our life should be stepping stones into a greater relationship with Christ. Into his power and structure of our life. Unless the seed die, it will not reproduce in magnificent ways. I pray that would be true in our life. A die to self is, is, a, is a, a positive, moving to a positive, die to self, live to Christ. Not my will, but thy will be done is the transition. I pray that in our hearts and life today in Jesus' name. Amen.